Now we are going to discuss uh, different topics. Requirement of track material, signaling and railway systems. So let's start from the requirement of railway track material. There are different standard rail sections. For the broad gauge, we are having 60 kilogram per meter section, 52 kilogram per meter, and 90 pound per yard. And the standard length of the rail, that is 13 meter of 42 feet. For meter gauge, we are having the three options, 90 pound per yard, 75 pound per yard, 60 pound per yard. For the first case, you can see that uh, the standard length of rail is 13 meter or 42 feet and for the other two cases, 12 meter or 39 feet. As far as the narrow gauge is concerned, here we are having the 50 pound per yard section and the standard length of the rail that is 12 meter or 39 feet. Now, look at this slide that is uh, first you can see that the requirement of track material for the broad gauge uh, you can see that the standard length of the rails for broad gauge is 13 meter or 42 feet or 14 yards for meter gauge uh, 12 meter or 39 feet or 13 yards and for the narrow gauge 12 meter 39 feet or 13 yards now look at this solid example. If sleeper density is M plus 7, then what will be the sleeper density in the British system? That means you will have to determine N plus the number, suitable number that must be put over here. Uh, in case of broad gauge, uh, when we say M is equal to 13, what does this mean? It means the sleeper are being provided at a distance of one meter. So considering this concept that here the sleeper density is m plus seven, so you know the standard length in the case of broad gauge is 13 meters, so obviously m will be taken as 13. 13 plus seven, so it means 20. You can say this is equal to 20. It means there are total 20 sleepers in that rail length. Now look at this m plus 7 that is obviously equal to n plus x. Actually we want to know this number x. So here you can substitute 13 for m. So 13 plus 7 on left hand side and on right hand side you know when we are considering n you know what does this mean the sleeper are being provided at a distance of one yard. So 42 feet, that is the standard length divided by three. So you are having this one and this thing is showing this thing that if the sleepers are provided at a distance of one yard, so you are having 42 over three plus X. So in this way, this is coming equal to 14 so on the left hand side we are having the 20, so 20 is equal to 14 plus x, so x is coming equal to 6. So you can say that the sleeper density is n plus 6. Okay, now look at this part that uh, as the standard length of the rail for the broad gauge is 13 meter, so number of rails per kilometer for broad gauge lines. 1000 divided by 13 and it is being multiplied by 2. Why 2? Because we are having the two rails, parallel rails. So in this way you can see that uh, the number of rails per kilometer for broad gauge line that is coming equal to 154. Then uh, Look at this, that uh, the weight of such 154, 52 kilogram, 
rails per meter. So it means we are going to use this particular section that is having the weight 52 kilogram per meter. So weight of 154 rails which are having the weight equal to 52 kilogram per meter. So that is obviously 52 multiplied by 154 and that is coming equal to 8008 kilogram. So the basic idea that we have used over here that is that one rail that is having the weight 52 kilogram per meter. So obviously 152 rails will be having 52 into 154 that is 8008 kilogram per meter weight. Now look at this slide. The number of sleepers required in this case as the sleeper density is m plus 7. It means number of sleepers per rail that would be 13 plus 7 that is 20. So the number of sleepers for kilometer that would be 77 multiplied by 20. Because uh, we have seen this thing that the number of sleepers uh, that is needed in this case for one kilometer length that would be 77 multiplied by 20 that is coming equal to 1540. Now fittings and fastening. First look at the number of fish plates per kilometer that would be equal to 2 into total number of rails per kilometer. So that is you know 2 into 154 that is 308. Number of fish bolts uh, that is equal to 4 into total number of rails per kilometer. So 4 into 154 that is coming 616. Then the number of bearing plates that is equal to the number of sleepers multiplied by 2 that is 1540 into 2 that is 3080 and the number of spikes that is equal to the number of bearing plates multiplied by 4 and that is obviously 12320 or you can take it as the number of sleepers multiplied by 8 so that is 1540 into 8 that is 12320. Okay, now if we consider an example uh, in the units of British system, so you can see here uh, we are considering the rail, the standard length of the rails for broad gauge that is 42 feet or you can say the 14 yards. Uh, but look at this important information which is given at the top that one mile is equal to 1.61 kilometer that is equal to 1760 yards and that is equal to 5280 feet. So number of rails per mile for broad gauge lines that will be equal to 1760 divided by 14 and multiplied by 2 because we are having the two parallel rails, sets of, sets of parallel rails. So you can see it is 1 to 6 multiplied by 2 and that is coming to 52. And let's say we are considering uh, the rail section which is having the weight 90 pound per yard. So weight of 90 pound rails per yard. So that means uh, if we consider 252 rails, so obviously 252 into 90, so you are having 2 to 6, 8 pound weight per yard. Now look at the number of sleepers. As sleeper density that we are considering over here is n plus 6. So it means the number of sleepers per rail that is equal to 42 over 3 because the standard length is 42 feet. We have converted into yard plus 6. So it means 20 sleepers. And obviously the number of sleepers per mile that would be 126 into 20 that is 2520 
and uh, we are we are having this 126 from here look at this 126 rails we are having on one side and 126 rails on the other side so here we'll be using 126 and it will be multiplied by 20 to get 2520 then look at the fittings and fastenings number of fish bolts per mile that is equal to 2 into the total number of rails per mile so that is obviously 2 into 252 into equal to 504 number of fish bolts that is 4 into the total number of rails per mile so 4 into 252 that is 1008 the number of bearing plates that is the number of sleepers into 2 so that is coming equal to 5040 and the number of spikes that is number of bearing plates multiplied by 4 so the answer is 2040 or we can take it as the number of sleepers into 8 that is again the 20160 okay now we have reached here the topic of signaling the primary objective of signaling and interlocking is to control and regulate the movement of trains including shunting operations safely and efficiently signaling enables the train to be controlled in such a way that the existing track is utilized to the maximum interlocking <clears throat> Mechanical connections established between various levers operating the signals and points in such a way that the working of signal mechanism may not go contrary to the desired purpose. Interlocking prevents setting of conflicting switches and signals. Objectives of signaling to regulate the movement of trains so that they can run safely at maximum permissible speed, to maintain distance between the trains that are running on the same line in the same direction, to maintain the safety of the two trains that have to cross or approach each other. Provide facilities for safe and efficient shunting to regulate arrival and departure of trains from the station yards, to run trains at restricted speed during repair and maintenance operation, to ensure the safety of the train when it comes in contact with road traffic at level crossing. Now look at the history of the signaling. Policemen provided signals to the train so flags were used during day and the lights were used at night. Railway signaling was first introduced in England in 1842 and in America in 1863. And interlocking was initially developed in 1856 and 1867 respectively in the England and in the America. In 1825, first railway line was opened between Darlington to Stockton, United Kingdom. Uh, uniform men or on horses guided the trains. 1830, first passenger train between Liverpool and Manchester. Policemen were posted at fixed intervals. Areas where signaling can prevent accidents Accidents at stations, accidents at uh, block station section, and the accidents at level crossing. Interlocking principle. You will have to check complete route for reception of train is unoccupied. You will have to ensure this thing. All points are correctly set and locked. All conflicting signals are at danger position and uh, red light must blow. Level crossing gates, if any, must be closed.
so we will have to check all these things and uh, you can see the red signal is there when you have, have confirmed all these things then green signal I meant to say the green light will glow well if you just look at the old interlocking system it looked like that and now look at this electric point so electronic uh, with the help of uh, you, this uh, arrangement we can operate we can move the tongue rails accordingly classification of signals visible and audible on the visible we are having the hand signals fixed signals uh, like caution indicators and stop signals audible signals audible signals such as detonators and fog signals are used in cloudy and foggy weather their sound can immediately attract the attention of the drivers detonators contain explosive material and are fixed to rail heads by means of clips in thick foggy weather detonators are kept about 90 meter ahead of the signal to indicate the presence of signal to the drivers once train passes they explode and driver become alert visible signals hand signals in the form of flags caution indicators and the stop signals so here you can see some signals visible so fixed signals showing the directions we are having disk and crossbar signal like this and I'm sure you have seen the semaphore signal like that uh, when the arm is in this position the right light will glow and it means uh, train cannot be allowed to proceed but when it is down and then green light will glow and then train can be allowed to move so use a signal arm which could be positioned at different angles like that you know point lock a point lock is provided to ensure that each point is set correctly it is provided near the tongue rail and near the toe of switch assembly the point lock consists of plunger and plunger rod plunger rod is connected with the signal additionally there are set of stretcher blades and each blade is connected to one of the tongue rails so this is the arrangement to operate to move the tongue rails accordingly okay now I will give you some exposure to the railway systems we are having first the urban railway transit urban rail transit is an all encompassing term for various types of local rail system providing passenger service within and around urban or older suburban areas and under this urban railway transit we are having different types tram light rail rapid transit monorail so one by one we will look at all these types so the trams are the systems that run mainly or completely along streets with low capacity and frequent stops passenger usually board at street or curb level light rail light rail is a relatively new term as an outgrowth of trams or street cars speeds are usually higher and articulated vehicles may be used to increase the capacity then comes the rapid transit a rapid transit underground subway tube elevated or metropolitan system is a railway 
usually in an urban area with a high capacity and frequency of service and uh, grade separation from other traffic. Monorail. Monorail is a metro or rail road with a track consisting of a single rail, actually a beam, as opposed to the traditional track with two parallel rails. Monorail vehicles are wider than the beam they run on. Then look at the suburban or rural run railways. Sub uh, mostly refers to a residential area. They may be the residential areas of a city or separate residential communities within commuting distance of a city. So here we are having the types like regional or commuter rail, intercity rail and the freight trains. So first look at the regional or commuter rail. Commuter rail, also called suburban rail, is a passenger rail transport service between a city center and outer suburbs and commuter towns or other locations that draw a large number of commuters. And you know, the commuters means the people who travel on a daily basis. Regional rail or a commuter rail runs on the track often shared with intercity rail and freight trains. Then comes the intercity rail. And uh, intercity rail services are express passenger train services that cover longer distances than commuter or regional trains. And the freight trains, a freight train or goods train is a group of freight cars or good wagons hauled by one or more locomotives on a railway ultimately transporting cargo between two points as part of the logistic chain. Okay, now I will give you some exposure to the high-speed rail. Benefits of high-speed trains. A new mode of transportation that would increase connectivity and accessibility to existing transportation systems, air transportation and underserved inland population. Safer, more reliable than highway or air travel. Quick, predictable travel time that would be sustainable over time. Lower passenger cost than air or auto travel would provide additional capacity for future generations, decreased energy consumption, reduced air pollution, and reduced reliance on petroleum, would cost two to three times less and have fewer environmental impacts than expanding highways and airports to meet future demands. Environmental impacts are minimized with most alignments within or adjacent to existing rail or highway right-of-way. So high-speed rail system in Asian countries, we are having the high-speed rail system in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and China. So this KTX uh, that is the Korea Train Express and then for the Japan we are having the Shinkansen and HSR for the Taiwan and HSR stands for High Speed Railway and for the China we are having CRH systems and uh, CRH stands for China Railway High Speed China Railway High Speed. 
So you can see here the high speed rail in Japan. This is in Korea. This is in the Taiwan. This is in China. In China. Again in China. So European HSR. So HSR stands for High Speed Railway. So you can see the major players are Spain, France, Germany and Italy and the other countries with uh, HSR that is the high speed railway. They are Holland, Belgium and England. And the different units we are having 200 km per hour, 250 km per hour, 300 km per hour and 350 km per hour. So here you can see the rolling stock or the train in the Spain speed is uh, equal to more than 300 km per hour so different trains can be seen. Well this is in the France and uh, TGV. TGV is uh, basically uh, the, if you just look at the French wording, so uh, the meaning of that French wording is high speed train. For high speed train, we are using the abbreviation TGV in the France. Again, this is in the France. And uh, this slide is interesting, and you can see that uh, on 3rd April 2017, 2007 a record was made that uh, the speed, look at this speed, 574.8 km per hour. But now this record has been broken by the Chinese railways. So look at this one, the next generation TGV. TGV, you know, high speed train and uh, that would be transformed into AGV. AGV stands for high speed multiple unit train. So major differences, distributed power, EMU rather than locomotive design and EMU stands for electric multiple unit, electric multiple unit, powered Jacob bogey, special type of bogies, reduced axle load, permanent magnet motors, synchronous motors are used, improved aerodynamic and more passenger space. And uh, here you can see the high speed trains in the Germany. And uh, you can see that uh, ICE, ICE stands for Intercity Express. Intercity Express. And uh, look at the speeds 280, 280, and 330 km per hour. Well, this is in Italy. And uh, you can see that ETR, ETR is uh, the abbreviation of uh, SX Terminal Railway, SX Terminal Railway. New TGV lines outside Asia and Europe you would find in the USA, Argentina, Morocco and Mexico. And uh, I have already mentioned this thing that TGV stands for high speed train. So there is a French uh, term and TGV is the abbreviation of that and the meaning of that is high speed train. TGV means high speed train. 
so here in the on the map of united states of america you can see that uh, blue colored lines are showing the intermediate speed rails and uh, the green lines are representing the high speed rail system that we are having in the united states of america so you can see the intermediate and high speed rail corridor designations in the usa so in this lecture we focused on the requirement of track material and we solved some examples and then we talked about the signaling and uh, we discussed different uh, railway systems of the world thank you